Part 21. Bree Canyon Road, 9.02 a.m. Reese and Sarah climbed the embankment to the two-lane road. Birds flew overhead, then dove into the bushes at the bottom of the wash behind them. A gauze-like fog glided in ghostly sheets across the field opposite the embankment. The air was heavy with the morning musk of moist leaves and plant sap. Reese took Sarah's hand and began walking south along the dirt shoulder. The scrub-dotted hills that rose only a few metres back from the road made them feel protected. The opposite side saw the embankment rising into the 57 freeway, running parallel with the highway. The subsonic whoosh of cars and trucks intermittently reached their ears. They were in an uninhabited pocket of Chaparral between Diamond Bar and Bree. Up ahead, they could see another line of hills pockmarked with derricks and slowly revolving oil pumps. Reese stopped at the foot of an on-ramp. We need a car, Reese said. We've got to keep moving. He pointed to the freeway above them. Where does that go? Sarah consulted the map. After going from page to page so she could see the interchanges, she answered, We can get on the 5 freeway and continue south. Reese had no idea where they were, and didn't care. He just wanted to be going away from the 800. When a dark blue Toyota sedan began rounding a curve in the road ahead, he pulled out the police revolver. Before he could step onto the highway, Sarah hissed, Put that away! She pulled his arm down, using both of her hands, then turned and raised her arm straight out, the thumb extended upward. The car slowed as it neared, then turned onto the ramp and sped up. The passengers, two teenaged boys, yelled obscenities as the driver, a rough-looking man wearing a hard hat, honked the horn. Reese wanted to raise the pistol again, but Sarah assured him, this works, really. He didn't understand the ceremony with the thumb, but decided to give her the benefit of the doubt. After all, she was Sarah Connor. Three minutes later, a large Primer Grey Chevy pickup rounded the curve. The driver slowed to a stop at the bottom of an on-ramp. Sarah and Reese approached the idling truck. Can we get a ride? She asked in her sweetest voice. Long, matted hair and a full beard, eyes and grinning mouth protruded from the window. Yeah, sure, but I'm just going to Irvine, you know. That'll be fine, Sarah said gratefully. Reese helped her climb into the back, among two bald spares, a bag of dirty clothes, and a battered wooden box of tools. He was glad her approach had worked, because the next one would have been his way. Panama Hotel, 9.22 a.m. The Terminator was running a system stat check on the internal display. The long column of readouts was sensed over the infrared image that came through the micro lenses in its eye sockets. Internal damage was nominal. The chassis seals were intact, the interior hydraulics functioning at capacity. Only the outer skin of organic flesh was subnominal. A patch of scalp had been blown away, revealing chromed metal crusted over with a thin coating of dried blood. Skin dangled from the cheek, and the drive cables underneath which moved the jaw, glistened in the tepid light. All over the cyborg's body there were bruises and abrasions, some of the latter putrid with gangrene. The circulatory system had been shut down when the tiny pneumatic pump that maintained pressure had been obliterated by a 12-gauge projectile. The Terminator had already sewed up, or crazy glued, the most severe of the ragged tears and gaping bullet holes that pockmarked its body, but the flesh was not healing. The room was filled with the cloying odour of decay. Several flies had spiralled up from the open garbage dumpsters in the alley below and had come through the open window. The Terminator was only vaguely aware of the insistent aerial assault. It only brushed a fly away if one crawled or flew onto its eye socket and obscured the machine's vision. The rest feasted freely on the lacerations the Terminator had not bothered to clean or repair. The internal stat check concluded on a readout of the Terminator's power supply. Consumption rate was low, under 0 0.013, less than one thousandth of the total energy available. Where a man's heart would be, 
shielded in a case-hardened sub-assembly inside the hyper-alloy torso, was the nuclear energy cell. It supplied power to run most of the sophisticated systems of hydraulic actuators and servo motors ever constructed, enough power to run the lights of a small city for a day. It was designed to last the Terminator considerably longer, especially if intense activity was varied with conservation procedures. When the Terminator dropped offline into economy mode, compact energy sinks collected and stored the excess. If the torso was breached and these vital power supplies disturbed, the Terminator could be stopped. But the torso was triple armoured with the densest alloy ever smelted. The Terminator could keep operating at full power for 24 hours a day for 1,095 days. During that time, it would certainly have opportunities, like now, for economy mode, where power was cut to 40% of nominal function. The optical system switched to infrared only. The pumps slowed. Power was shunted into sinks and stored. With conditions like those so far encountered on this mission, the Terminator could operate indefinitely, plow through all opposition, and complete the target elimination, then stagger programless through the nuclear devastation caused by Skynet and walk up to its machine masters to be programmed anew. The Terminator would be around for a long, long time. The flies, already bloating on the cyborg's decaying flesh, would have been happy to hear that. Five Freeway South, 9.57 a.m. The truck had veered onto the five interchange and was slowing in the thickening morning traffic. The mechanical thunder of semis rumbled Reese into alertness. They were surrounded by cars, vans and trucks for as far as the eye could see. They were coming into Tustin and the opposite sides of the eight-lane freeway were now bordered by recently constructed three- and six-storey glass and concrete buildings most of them banks or savings and loans. Orange County was a prosperous, entrepreneurial and doggedly conservative metropolis. Although cities had flavorful names like Villa Park, Orange, Placentia and Yorba Linda, they were basically alike. Reese could make nothing of any of this. There was just too much, too much. Traffic began to lighten and the truck sped out of Tustin. Buildings began to give way to the few remaining orange groves left in Orange County. Sarah looked into the wind and saw they were approaching a wall of eucalyptus trees. She suddenly remembered that El Toro Marine Base was on the far side of those trees. If she ever needed a battalion of marines. <laughs> but then she remembered the police station. She stole a glance at Reese. He was just one man. Really not any older than she, although his eyes seemed ancient. He alone had snatched her from certain death, again and again. A tough kid with one hell of a sense of duty. And yet now, huddled as he was in the back of the pickup, he seemed diminished, insubstantial, a cowed and vulnerable phantom. The truck was slowing, drifting into the outside lane. Sarah craned around and saw that they were getting off the freeway at Sand Canyon Road. The truck turned into a gas station at the foot of the ramp. End of the line, the driver cheerfully told them. Panama Hotel, 10.05 a.m. Rodney pushed the squeaky cart out of the bathroom at the end of the hall and grunted when his voluminous stomach folded like an unwilling accordion as he bent low to retrieve the out-of-order sign that had fallen off the door. He tossed it onto the cart, where it slid between bottles of disinfectant and cleanser. Rodney relit a half-smoked cigar, then puffed on it savagely, blowing smoke around his bald head to drown the acrid odour of the cleaning fluids. Rodney knocked perfunctorily and opened the door on 102. Jasmine smiled when he came in, looking up from the red lacquered nails that hadn't dried yet. Jasmine's real name was Bob Hurtle but Rodney could never get over the shape of his legs as he strolled the sidewalks in front of the Panama. The high heels really sculpted his calves. Rodney didn't care how they paid the rent as long as they paid. Jasmine, wearing a long slip, 
sat amid his life's possessions in the 8x11 room and crooned to Rodney, taunting him as always. Rodney was inured. He swept up quietly, then left. When he got to 103, he was met by bad news. The odour was faint, but unmistakable, and all he could think was, oh shit, not another dead wino. This'll be two this month, with fucking cops everywhere, and all the girls will be bitching and throwing their eyebrow tweezers at me. Figuring he'd better get it over with, Rodney knocked on the door. He heard brittle floorboards creak, but no one answered. He knocked again, then said, Hey buddy, what have you got in there? A dead cat? Hoping that was all it was. The Terminator had been arranging the things he had taken from Sarah's apartment on the bug-infested bed, when the rap on the door caused the cyborg to kick back online into alert status. Within 1.7 seconds, the .357 Magnum Auto was in its hand, cocked and aimed at the person on the other side of the door. A faint infrared heat trace outlined the figure of a man standing there. Since it determined from the subject's tone of voice, physical condition and passive behaviour, no attempt at entry, that the man was not a threat, the Terminator did not fire through the door. This action could threaten the security of the base of operations and was therefore not a viable option. A list of alternative verbal responses came up on the internal display. No. Yes. I don't know. Please come back later. Go away. Fuck you. Fuck you, asshole. The last flickered prominently, and the Terminator vocalised loudly enough to be heard through the door. Fuck you, asshole. Fuck you too, pal. Rodney answered, then pushed the cart to the end of the dingy hall. A live son of a bitch wino beats a dead one any day. Inside the fetid room, the Terminator brushed at the flies that were laying eggs in the open eye socket. Clearing the lens with a rag, the machine picked up Sarah's address book and began to scan, methodically, the rapidly flipped pages. Preliminary probability analysis indicated that the clue to track down its quarry would be in here. It might take time, but time was meaningless to it. Sand Canyon Road, 10.48 a.m. After gassing up, the battered pickup had rumbled off down Sand Canyon Road, leaving Sarah and Reese in a cloud of exhaust. Sarah looked around. A mobile station. Across the way, a recreational trailer park. Alongside that, a picnic area where two families and their children romped in the brown grass. Sarah saw Reese studying a damp field of strawberries that abutted the picnic area. He seemed so strange standing there, a man torn out of one time and never able to fit into this one. Reese sensed she was watching and faced her with a weary, sober expression. His face was dirty and his hair looked as if rats had been nesting there. Sarah gave him a small encouraging smile and indicated the restrooms around the corner of the service station. We'd better get cleaned up while we can. Reese nodded and simply followed her quietly. When they reached the doors, he continued to follow her into the women's room. She stopped him with one hand and chuckled when she saw the confusion in his eyes. Pointing at the other door, she said, That one's yours. I'm afraid you're on your own. Reese looked from the door marked women to the one that said men. Realising his mistake, he shrugged, bemused, and went in the right one. Sarah took care of business with great relief and then examined the battered facade she presented to the mirror. The watery soap from the encrusted dispenser couldn't get all the makeup off, but it did take care of the obvious dirt. Her hair was another matter. She didn't even have a brush. Wrinkling her lips, she ran her fingers through the tangle and frowned at the results. Beyond windblown. Hopefully, people would think it was a new style. Then she laughed softly to herself about that for a moment. What the hell did it matter what anyone thought now? When she emerged from the bathroom, she could not see Reese. Sarah knocked on the men's room door. Nothing. A club of fear slammed down. She rounded the building and saw a pack of children tossing a small green Nerf football over the head of a big, panting Irish setter. 
It barked and loped in crazy circles as the green missile soared from one youngster to the other. A Lincoln Continental was guzzling gas at one of the pump islands. Reese was gone. She blinked with rising despair, suddenly realising how powerful her need for his protection was. All the other roots of her life had been yanked out, except for her mother. Realising in a painful crush all at once that her mother might think she was dead, Sarah rushed to a payphone at the corner of the lot. She had no money, but she remembered her calling card code and dialed the little house in San Bernardino. Almost before the first ring was finished, the anxious voice of her mother came on the line. It took over a minute to assure her that her daughter was still alive and well. The police at the Rampart Division were looking for her, and what they assumed was a suspect in the slaughter there. Sarah was about to explain the situation and ask for her mother to come and get her when she saw Reese standing in the strawberry field. Relief washed away the fear in a sudden gush. Sarah gripped the phone and closed her eyes, her lower lip quivering. Her mother was demanding that Sarah tell her where she was so she could pick her up. Sarah realised she was better off with Reese for the time being. No one else could really help, because no one else would believe and take whatever precautions Reese knew to take. Sarah ducked around the edge of the wall-mounted phone booth, pulling the receiver with her. Reese had made it clear that she was to have no contact with anyone, and she was afraid of what his reaction might be if he caught her on the phone. She cupped her hand around her mouth to keep her voice from carrying. She spoke rapidly and with a commanding urgency that would have surprised her had it been recorded and played back later. Mum, listen carefully. I don't have much time to talk. What is it, dear? What's happening? Just listen. I want you to pack some things. Pack quickly and go to the cabin. Don't tell anyone where you're going. Not even your friends. Not even Louise. Just go. Do it right away. I can't explain now. You'll have to trust me. I have to know what's... Just do it. If you don't, I won't be able to contact you again. God, Sarah. All right. All right. Sarah glanced at Reese, standing strangely immobile, facing away from her. If he started to turn, she would have to drop the phone and start walking. Wouldn't that just freak her mother out? Okay, Mum. I'll call you up there later. Don't worry about me. I'll be okay. Sarah, listen to me. You have to get word to the police somehow. You don't understand. They can't help me. Nobody can. I've got to get going. Sarah! Bye, Mom. She hung up, cutting off the tiny voice. Reese was kneeling now, his back to her, picking a strawberry. He brushed it off and bit into it. She couldn't read his expression from this distance, but somehow his former rigid and precisely controlled body language had now seemed to completely melt away. He got slowly to his feet, licking his fingers, deep in thought, then the green nerf ball was spiralling through the air right at his back. Just before it struck, Reese's body snapped into a crouch as he whirled around and batted the ball to the ground. The children froze, then huddled for a moment before sending the youngest of them, a little girl not older than six, out to retrieve the ball. Sarah felt some alarm at the tense stance Reese was maintaining, as if he thought the kids had tried to strike him deliberately. She hurried her steps across the street towards the field, but the girl was already standing at Reese's feet, staring up and squinting in that sidelong and sage way kids do when they suddenly get a fix on an adult. As Sarah came up behind Reese, she slowed. The little girl was saying, We didn't mean to scare you. Can we have our ball back now? Reese slowly unwound like a metal band and dropped his eyes to the ball. He swallowed the tension in his throat and bent to pick it up. With the same gentleness he had shown Sarah earlier that morning, the soldier offered the nerf ball. The girl hesitated, looking into those wild eyes from another time, perhaps sensing the horror and despair there. But then she sensed something else, something stronger and much more benevolent. She began to smile as she grabbed the ball out of Reese's hands. Immediately, she wheeled around and held up the object of her mission and screamed triumphantly, 
I got it! I got it! Just then, the setter completed its high arc, initially aimed at the ball in the child's hand, a bit lower than desired, smacking the girl against Reese's legs. The dog scrambled after the fallen prize. A moment later, it lumbered into the knot of youngsters and dropped the now slobbery ball in their midst. Reese helped the stunned girl back onto her feet. He was wearing something a little like a smile, but it was too new an expression for him to get quite right. The girl primly pulled down her dress and sniffed with solemn distaste. You smell icky, she announced, then pranced off to rejoin her friends. Kyle, are you okay? Furrows, like the one on the ground, began to form on his forehead. He wanted to speak, but some powerful inner force resisted it. Finally, his mouth began to move, forming words that were all but inaudible. I wasn't meant to see this, he said simply. When he reopened his eyes, Sarah was amazed at the lost expression there, almost as if he were about to cry. I wasn't meant to see this, he said simply. When he reopened his eyes, Sarah was amazed at the lost expression there, almost as if he were about to cry. They briefed me. I've seen pictures, maps, I've heard the stories, but I didn't expect. He was having trouble speaking again. Sarah moved closer. I'm all wrong here, I can't stop wanting to be part of this. He had no vocabulary to encompass her world. Sarah made an attempt to touch his shoulder. He was locked on her face, oblivious to the touch. She tried to soothe him with words of her own. Kyle, you are a part of this. This is your world now. He shook his head with such violence that Sarah recoiled. No, 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 he was muttering. Don't you see, Sarah? I can't stop for anything. I can't be anything but a soldier with a... And here he stumbled again, but more from emotion than a lack of words. Kyle, I... Duty, he interrupted. Reese realised he wasn't making much sense. He grabbed her shoulders and tried to shake the reality of the situation into her. Sarah, don't you realise? All of this is gone. Where I come from... This is a wasteland, littered with the bones of people like that. He pointed towards the families at the picnic tables. Sarah looked around, trying to see it as he did. The children, the dog, the fields, they were all so familiar. She was no more aware of them than of fishes of water. But to him, it must be like some idyllic dream, the paradise lost, of which only bitter half-memory survived into his time. Now that she had glimpsed his world, she could begin to fathom the pain and disorientation he must be feeling just walking down the street. And then he stopped, because he realised that the children were staring at him with a mixture of curiosity and fear. The parents were craning back towards him and Sarah. He was making them conspicuous, failing his primary duty, failing John, failing himself threatening Sarah's precious life with his lack of emotional control. He clamped down, slamming all the doors shut on his feelings, and grabbed her arm. We gotta move, he said, and pulled her towards the freeway on-ramp.